Alright, hello everyone, this is EngineFan020 back with yet another video. Today we're at a little bit of a, we're having a little bit of a, a different sort of video today. We're out on location at the Grapevine Vintage Railroad in Grapevine, Texas. And right in front of me is a very special guest. Uh, he has a YouTube channel of his very own and he is a uh, expert, a rail enthusiast. And he's going to tell us all about the Grapevine Vintage Railroad. Now, uh, sir, what is your name? Uh, my name is Sam. All right. And what is your YouTube channel, Sam? The Texas Train Master 2248. Texas Train Master 2248. Yep. If you haven't heard of it, go subscribe right now. <laughs> I've got 387. <laughs> all right. He needs them. <laughs> so, um, where are you from, Sam? Well, I was born in Dallas, raised in Keller, currently living in Bedford, and I've got plans to move to Stephenville in about five or six years and start a ranch home. Awesome. Awesome. And um, tell us about your affiliation with the uh, Grapevine Vintage Railroad real fast. Well, when I was a kid, I took my first train right here. I was probably, oh, I'd say about five or six years old. And at the time, it was called the Tarantula Train. And we came out here, it was my birthday, I'm sorry to say, but my child is kind of fuzzy about that day. But I do remember this. My mom took a picture of me, and the conductor's holding me up, and I'm trying to pull this hat on my head. I still laugh at that picture. And my uncle, when he was around, took me to the steam engine, old puppy, and we climbed to the cab in the, in the yard. I sat in the engine, and ears left reached up, pulled the whistle cord, and screamed because it scared me half to death. Oh my. <laughs> it was a nice day though. They were also nice to me. We got to ride down to the turntable and back and it was wonderful. And I hope to do it again someday and give a special list of blasts just for my uncle if they'll let me. Awesome. Sounds very nice. Oh yeah. And uh, tell us about your YouTube channel. So on my channel, I do videos on trains and the Fort Worth stockyards. Um, I don't really have a lot of videos I want to do just yet. I do have future plans to start a Patreon account um, and Super Chat, hopefully, and do product reviews on all trades if need be. I mean, hopefully, not maybe, hopefully. Um, currently, I've got videos about the railway here in Grapevine. Um, I have stuff about the stockyards already. Just whatever I think of comes to mind, I'll make a video about it. It all depends. Alright, alright. So, lots of train fun from Mr. <laughs> Texas Train Master 2248. All right, so my first question for you today is how are the Cotton Belt Route and the Fort Worth and Western, Western Railroad related to the Grapevine Vintage Railroad? And well, you can start anywhere you like. Well, I'm going to give you guys a history of the Cotton Belt, and this is scripted, by the way. I want to give a shout out to Trinity Rail Productions for taking the time to copy and paste this and make it for me. And thank you to Engine Zero Two Zero for printing it and bringing the script out for us today. Yes, sir. And while you're, I'm reading this, folks, hopefully he's posted it, images of the cotton belt on screen for different phases, so it's not boring enough to see me read. You get to actually hear about the cotton belt itself. See the cotton belt. Yep. And also, disclaimer: we are not being paid, sponsored, or endorsed by anybody from the railway to do this. This is purely for fun and entertainment purposes only. This video is not being used to make money in any way. Please do not sue us or give us a hard time. Just enjoy the video. Thank you. Yep. Not for profit. Not at all. This is just for fun. Everything we use, photograph, video, stuff like that, we do not take credit for it. It belongs to the respected owners and photographers and videographers. There you hear it. All right. The St. Louis Southwestern Railway or the Cup. The St. Louis Southwestern Railway is best remembered as an important Southern Pacific subsidiary. However, its omitted years carry on uh, carry no SP ties. It was conceived to formative years. Oh, I'm sorry, folks, a little tongue tied there. It was conceived to provide Tyler, Texas with rail service just after the Civil War, and in time while sent it to a um, respectable 725 mile narrow gauge system connecting Brings Point, Wyatt, Missouri with Gatesville, Texas. According to Dr. George Hamilton's book, American Narrow Gauge Railroads, its three foot network was the second longest in the country. 
Escalade only by the Denver and Rio Grande. It consequently became known as the Cotton Belt Route, and St. Louis Interstates utilized it as an outlet for cotton shipments between Texas and the Gateway City. Its early years were fought with financial difficulty, but the modern railroad was generally profitable. It became the St. Louis Southwestern in the early 1890s, and then went through a series of owners before Southern Pacific gained control during the 1930s. It thrived at the time. It thrived at this time as a thorough route between St. Louis, Texas, St. Louis and Texas, and still plays an important role in the Union Pacific today. The St. Louis Southwestern Railway is often mentioned in publications or historical texts, although it is not always clear what the company was or when it operated. It spent most of the 20th century controlled by another carrier, first as part of the Gold Empire, and then later under the Rock Island. Things remained this way until Southern Pacific purchased the railway. In 1947, Cotton Belt's Public Relations Department released a compact but comprehensive booklet detailing switch pages there its corporate heritage. It was entitled A Short History of the St. Louis Southwest Railway Lines, written by Jacob E. Anderson, but was transformed into a successful 1,154 mile class from railroad in its race with the Mops Red Balls, Cotton Belt Goes Like a Blue Streak, by Steve Patterson, from the November 1950, November 1962 issue of Trades Magazine, did not begin as such. It all started as a local community's dream to connect with the outside world. After the citizens of Tyler, Texas realized the, import, uh, the International Railroad would not reach their town, they took it upon themselves to build their own. The Tyler Top Railroad was granted incorporation by the state legislature on December 1st, 1871 for the and this is quoted, there's quotation marks around this next paragraph. Right to locate, construct, own, operate, and maintain a railroad with a single or double track from Tyler to such a point not exceeding 40 miles from the above town on, in, on either the Southern Pacific, Houston, and Great Northern, or the International Railroad as may be selected by the directors. That's a mouthful. But that's what they talked back in that century. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was led by the town's mayor, Major James B. Douglas, and originally capitalized at $1 million. Less than two years later, on May 7, 1837, sorry, 1873, the act was amended to increase capitalization to $3 million, and the route was changed to quotation marks, run north from Tyler by the way of Gilmore, Pittsburgh, Mount Pleasant, and Clarksville to some point at the Red River. The state provided further aid at ranging a 200-foot right-of-way and a five-mile swath for the procurement of construction materials, lumber, dirt, gravel, etc. A completion date of May 1875 was set for the first 20 miles, at which point the railroad would be given further support through the land grants, totaling 640 acres for every completed mile. Fortunately, delays were immediate as financing never materialized. This issue caused promoters to abandon the original standard gauge plan and instead would build the Tyler Tap as a three foot narrow gauge. Actual work did not begin until the summer of 1875, with the first 11.1 miles operated, um, opened by October 3rd, 1877. It was soon extended to four, 
different video today as you can see we're not in my own home we are out on location at the grapevine vintage railroad in grapevine texas and right in front of me is a very special guest we have um another youtuber who is uh a uh, train enthusiast now uh tell us your name good sir i am sam sam and uh what is your youtube channel the Texas Train Master 2248. All right, Texas Train Master 2248. And what do you do on that channel? I make videos about uh, trains in the form of stockyards, and I really enjoy doing that. All right, awesome, awesome. So, um, all right, so um, quickly before we get into the interview, uh, we just kind of want to know a little bit about yourself. So, uh, where are you from? And um, what is your affiliation with the Great Bank Finish Railroad? Well, currently I live in Bedford, Texas, uh, but hopefully in a, some seven years I can move down to Steepville and start a ranch with some friends of mine. And now this railroad was the first train I rode when I was a kid, of course, at the time it was called the Tarantula. I took my first train right here, I was about oh, five or six years old, and it was nice. Um, unfortunately, I don't remember very much from that day, my childhood is kind of fuzzy. Um, but I do remember this. A conductor helped me up, and I'm trying to hold his hat on my head while my mom takes a picture. That's still left with that. And my other memory I have is coming out after the train ride to the uh, engine shed where Puffy is, and I got to find him in the cab, and I reached up, I pulled the whistle cord, and screamed because it was so loud it scared me out to death. Oh my. At the same time, though, I loved it. And, uh, I got to ride down to the turntable in back. My uncle was with me there. They were also nice. It was a fantastic time. Right. And I come back to ride every now and then, and there's always something about this train I like. It's special, and you know, I was take home a new memory. So hey, why not? Yes, and it's a very special railroad to me as well. Awesome. Um, so um, my first question is, uh, how are the Cotton Belt route and the 
Fort Worth and Western Railroad related to the Grapevine Vintage Railroad, and you can start anywhere you like. Well, I'm going to give you guys a brief history on the cotton belt, and this was scripted originally, but we are not going to be using the script because it is too long. Also, a quick disclaimer. This video is not being used to make money. We are not paid, sponsored, or endorsed by anybody from any railways to do this. Any materials we use, such as books, photographs, or videos, we do not take credit for. All goes to the respective photographers. This video is not being used to make money. This is family friendly, so anybody can watch. This is being used for entertainment purposes only, so please enjoy. Thank right. you. So, in short, please don't sue us. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right, so the Cotton Belt Railroad, or Cotton Belt Route, I should say. Well, the Cotton Belt is St. Louis Southwestern started back in 1877. It was just a narrow gauge railway, which eventually expanded to being over a thousand miles in length. And um, it got the name Cotton Belt because, well, the logo, as you can see on my hat, is a cotton gin blade. They did a lot of cotton shipments as well, and they lasted for a while, but then in the 1930s, or 40s, I forget, the Southern Pacific purchased the railway, and it became a subsidiary of it. Um, and in fact, if you look at a lot of photographs of the Cotton Belt, you'll see they have the same paint scheme as the SP, such as the daylight and the black window. And so it makes sense. Um, the railway had a good success and a good career. Um, but then, of course, the SP merged with the Union Pacific. But the Cotton Belt still plays a major role with the company altogether. And Sally said there's not much of Cotton Belt the steam locomotives left are barely any depots left. There's a couple of museums. You've got the depot in Tyler, Texas, the museum in St. Louis, Missouri, and the museum in Pine Bluffs, Arkansas. Oh. And if you go to Pine Bluff, you'll see the famous steam engine, the good old Cotton Belt 819. Now, supposedly, she's being worked on to come back to life. And if she does, hopefully I can go and chase her like I chased the big one. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, why don't you take the camera and I'll show you the stuff I got to do with the Cotton Belt. All right. So all right, what do we have there? So everything that you're seeing here all has to do with the railway. I've got timetables and books and a map. Just various items, uh, rule books, stuff with numbers. Um, there we go, your questions. That's all right, keep going. You can get yeah, those in a minute. We'll, we'll, we'll keep going. That's a blooper, keep it in. <laughs> If you're wondering what happened, folks, while he was filming, his questions blew off the table. Yeah. <laughs> now you know he has a cheat sheet. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> this right here is an accident report from the Cotton Bell, as you can see. They happen now and again, don't they? They do. This is a metal sign of the Cotton Bell route. All right. That's the logo, and it shows the years of service and operation. They lasted for a good time. I wish the Cotton Bell could have lasted a bit longer. But, well, really emerging has been around for a long time. Now we have two copies of the same book. I didn't realize I had done that. Okay. That's all right. Keep going. All right. We have a couple of posters and a data sheet on the Cotton Belt right here, as you can see. All right, the poster. Yeah, advertising. The data sheet. We have a newsletter right here on the Cotton Belt. Newsletter. This is a pocket uh, calendar. This was a uniform code book. Probably the hardest to find item is this paperweight right here. I found this at the train show. Wow. How much did it cost? It was 50 bucks. Wow. This right here is a bumper sticker from the Cotton Belt. Bumper sticker. And of course, there are various other books I brought, and a copy of Trains Magazine over there, as you can see. Not many books have been made about this railway, but they're all pretty unique. Probably my favorite of the two publications by Steve Allen Gowen. He is the Texas Railroad author, for those of you who don't know who he is. And the book, Cotton Belt Engineer, well, I know the guy who wrote it. I just wanted to meet him and get his autograph in it. Wow. Impressive. Uh, two more items I could not put on the table, which I will now hold up to show. <laughs> Son, what did what you got there? Is that your questions? Yeah. Where's your questions? All right. 
And the other items I have is this. This is a cotton duck calendar, as you can see. Inside, though, there are not pictures of trains. In fact, these were kids' drawings, and some are just amazing for this for the time it was made. And the other my it's under here, so it doesn't blow away. The other item I have is this poster here, as you can see. All right. Now there's another item I could not bring today because I could not fit it in my bag, but you should be seeing a picture of it on screen right about now. It's a St. Louis Southwestern Conductor's Hat. That is the most expensive cotton belt item I have purchased. It was about 80 bucks at the train show, but wow. worth it. <laughs> so the cotton belt had quite a big influence on the city of Graceline and the rest of the country. And well, the metal sign speaks for itself with the route map of where it ran. They ran through a couple of states and it would have been nice to have been on that train. Now then, I'll tell you about the cotton belt when it came to Grapevine. Alright. Look at it right here. And while I'm reading about this, folks, hopefully he took the time to post the photographs on screen of the cotton belt. That's my cue. <laughs> <laughs> you got all the time you need. the scripts. Took me a second there. Alright, so here is how the cotton belt made its way to Grapevine, Texas. And I'll show you guys some photographs afterwards of the cotton belt in Grapevine. The Grapevine Depot was constructed around 1901 and probably replaced an earlier, simpler structure that would have served as a terminal for passenger and freight service. The station was originally located in what is now the middle of Main Street, about 30 feet west of its present site, with the road curving around to the building and then ending in the farm fields about 100 yards to the south. The St. Louis Southwestern Railway, formerly called the Cotton Belt, arrived at Grapevine in 1881 as its tracks reached um, from the Texas-Arkansas border towards Fort Worth. Road service brought new prosperity to the Great Vine um, Prairie by making good easier, goods easier to bring in to the remote agriculture community and speeding shipment of products yeah. grow. There, mostly cotton in the late 19th century. I think there's some typos in this, folks. That's okay. Uh, to markets by the way of St. Louis and the Missouri River. Later, after the turn of the century, crops grown locally were shipped by rail to Dallas, Fort Worth, and other nearby markets. The Grapevine Depot, with its um, segregated passenger waiting rooms, telegraph operator, and station agent office, and large freight storage room, was a hub of commercial activity in the early 1900s. Farming implements and equipment were shipped in, and even building materials for the many new homes built near the downtown in the early years of the century arrived at the depot by flat car. By the 1930s, however, and unfortunately, automobiles and trucks were increasingly common ride ship on the cotton belt to and from Grapevine declined. Thank you, Henry Ford. Oh, no. In 1937, my railroad decided to demolish a portion of the depot, probably to save maintenance costs. Well, a 42-foot section of the structure was removed from the center of the building. The remaining structure was also moved some 50 feet east to allow the town to straighten Main Street. 
One of the waiting rooms and half of the freight room were removed during this renovation. Around 1961, the remaining waiting room on the west end of the building was also demolished, leaving only the office and a portion of the freight room behind. By 1972, the Cotton Belt decides or decided to abandon the Grapevine Depot altogether. But thanks to the efforts of a number of all right, we apologize for that brief interruption, folks. Uh, you know, my camera it cuts out every 12 minutes or so. Uh, well, actually, you might not know that, but you do now. It, it cuts out every 12 minutes or so, and so uh, we had to pick back up again. <laughs> and no, Sam. he's going to use his air brakes. When you hear air brake, that means the camera is going to stop, and we got to wait a minute. That's right. And folks, don't worry for being so close with this camera. I'm getting back at him. He's making me a mile of puppy. Yes. <laughs> uh, I will do that. Um, oh, there well, there the you go. Brakes. They are finally <laughs> released. Don't worry, the handbrakes are set. Yeah. I'll start over with the previous paragraph. All right. Whenever you're ready. By 1972, the cotton belt decided to abandon the Grapevine Depot altogether. But thanks to the efforts of a number of citizens, including Mrs. Alberta Needleton and the Grapevine Garden Club, the building was saved and given to the city. Moved in 1973 to Heritage Park, the depot became the home of the Grapevine Historical Society's Museum, which has now been removed again to the Grapevine Ice House. If you go there today, you can find it there. The original railroad land became available for purchase in 1991, and the Grapevine Heritage Foundation acquired the free 0.2 acre site to develop the Grapevine Heritage Center. The depot and the section foreman's house also moved away from its original site decades before were removed and were moved back to the um, appropriate locations. However, the foreman house is off by an inch. You can't know this, but that's what I'm told. An inch? An inch? Sweet mercy. Wow. The Heritage Foundation raised funds through major grants from the Meadows Foundation, the and the Lancaster Memorial Fund, Joe and um, Cecilia Box, um, numerous local civic organizations, corporations, and more than 160 individuals to restore the depot to its original 1901 size and appearance. Reopened on January 31st, 1994, exactly 22 years after the closure of the railroad. The depot now serves new generations of Grapevine residents and visitors as a reminder of the community's rich railroad history. That's quite a history. It certainly is. Now I've got a few photographs to show you guys of the depot. Time for this paper to be for done, used for its intended purpose. Yes. So here's the first photograph. This was taken back in 1895, or 1888, I forget. And this was like only one of the few pictures ever taken of the depot itself. Photographs are rare, the Cotton Bell Depot in Grapevine. But as you can see, everybody's looking at the camera. They're not interested in the train. That's Cotton Bell Engine 154. It's an eight-wheeler. I'm not sure if it's an 080 or an American type. I looked it up in a book I have on Cotton Belt Locomotives. I could not bring either. It's in my bag. It's not in there. Well, I'm sorry. It is in there, but it says 8-wheeler. And if you look in the back, I don't know if you can tell, but right there is the Foreman House in its original location. This is a good photograph. It's one of my favorites. It's my second favorite after the historic picture at Promontory Summit. Okay. This next photograph is a later picture of the depot, and I would say this would have been probably the 1930s or 1940s. I'm not sure what the year is, there's no date. This is the view that you would see on the tracks, and well, as you can see, it still is, and the wind's affecting the way I hope this photograph. As you can <laughs> see, it's a very well done uh, building as is. Um, I can actually know what year was taken. Sorry if I said it a bit too, folks. We're just trying to rush this because of the weather. If you get a picture of those, you can see the depot.
I then have three very hard to find photographs. Don't blow my paper away yet. Now these were taken by a photographer who the guy who wrote the book Cotton Belt Engineer knows, although I will not give away his name. And again, I don't take credit for these pictures either. To us! Right. <laughs> These are pictures of a freight train passing the station. So here's the train coming in, as you can see. It's in frame, right? Yeah. This is the train as it's getting closer. It's being pulled by an Alco RS3, it looks like. Alco RS3. Amazing. You need to learn about diesels, Mr. Steam Free. <laughs> Here's the last photograph of it. It's like really around point with the camera, so these are pretty cool pictures of the train coming in. Photography is an art. It sure is. Ask Steve Allen Goen or Ken Fitzgerald. Yep. Now, another thing I forgot to mention. Well, we're going to come to this layer, but I'll mention it quick. But there's a new light rail system called Texture that runs through Grapevine. Actually, we're not going to talk about that today. It's too new. It hasn't been long enough to be considered historic. It's been around since 2018, I believe. But before the railroad was built, they had to have some train come out and inspect the place. So, this photograph shows the TRE sending out an RDC car. Now, explain to the viewers what, what is the TRE real fast. The Trinity Rail Express is a commuter train that runs from Dallas to Fort Worth. All right. But this is um, the only picture I have seen so far of another train coming into the depot besides Cotton Belt and Fort and Western. We'll get to the Fort and Western here a bit later. So it's a pretty cool photograph, as you can see. And then the last photograph of the depot. I have is this. Now the ramp has since been replaced with a newer sturdy ramp. This ramp is old, but this is kind of how the building looks today. As you can see compared to the previous photographs, it is much shorter than it was before. But there you have it. So the cotton belt is no longer around with us, but you can still see pieces of equipment in old stations like this one here in Grapevine and read about it in books. The cotton belt has had a few songs written about it, including Cotton Belt by, sorry, Riding the Cotton Belt by Johnny Cash. And many documentaries on it, I wish there were more written about it, but still, it's a pretty cool riddle. All right, if you want, you can cut the camera set for the next segment. All right, we'll be right back. Any more questions, just ask. All right, so, hello, we are back now with a different setup. We are now getting ready to talk about the Fort Worth and Western Railroad, and if Sam would uh, kindly take it away. And this is scripted again, folks. But first, I'll show you a map of the railway. The Fort Worth and Western today currently maintains over 30 locomotives, about 300 miles of track. I could be a bit over. If anybody from the Fort Worth and Western is watching, they're going to correct me in the comments. Here is the map of the railway, as you can see. Let's zoom in. And it's fast. upside down. Womp womp. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Got it? Got it. Alright. So, as you can see, this is where they go. They go down to Cleveland and a few other parts of Texas. So, it's a good short line. And your cam is probably picking up the train whistle in the background. That's because there's another train coming and some robbers are on it. <laughs> Just wait and see. So here is a brief history on the 4th and Western Railway. The 4th and Western Railroad began in 1987. The local businessman, Bill Davis, and Bob Robertson bought six and a half miles of former Frisco trackage from Burlington, Burlington Northern, stretching from Bell Junction on the south side of Fort Worth, the site of the now demolished Tower 60 on the north side. 
Chrysler's began the next year, and the FWWR has now grown into a pers uh, prosperous 276 mile short line river with six subdivisions, ranging as far as East Carrollton, north of Dallas, and more than 200 miles southwest of Fort Worth to San Angelo. Interchanging with three classes of railroads in Fort Worth, and the short line in San Angelo, with headquarters and dispatching located in Fort Worth, the FWWR provides services including switching, transloading, storage, and business management to around 100 customers, including Miller Beer. Fourth and Western's Fort Worth Cotton Belt Line from Fort Worth Eastern Grapevine to Carrollton was acquired in 1996 by Leeds from Dallas Area Rapid Transit, or DART. This Cotton Belt Corridor hosts Grapevine Finnish Railroad excursion trains on weekends and occasional weekends between Grapevine and the historic Fort Worth Stockyards, and is currently undergoing construction to become DART's summer line passenger route provide transit from DFW International Airport uh, through Carrollton, northeast to Plano. <coughs> it wasn't until 1998 that the Fourth and Western truly lived up to its name with its purchase of the old Santa Fe Preston subdivision and the Dublin subdivision. Pages to them. Now the papers don't want to cooperate. There we go. The Crescent sub originally, originally ran from Carrollton to Crescent to Weatherford, but it now ends Crescent, where it meets the Dublin sub. The line into Weatherford was abandoned. The current Dublin sub extends 134 miles from Belt Junction to Fort Worth, southwest through from Crescent to Ricker, where it meets the BNSF um, Lamp Lampasas subdivision. BNSF retains trackage rights on the Delta set, and FWWR has trackage rights on the Lampas set, east to San Angelo Junction. Fourth the West is for those, uh, Sorry, folks, that's an allergies today. Fourth and Western's first locomotive was leased from the Econo Rail in 1988. Apparently, there was an old vintage a returning in form of CF7-2569, which had re been, been rebuilt from Santa Fe F7A number 213C in Cleburne in 1973. It was delivered in dark blue paint with large FWR lettering on the plates, on its planks. Number 2569 was replaced two years later by Econo Rail CF7 2473, which was a 1976 graduate of Cleveland. In 1993, with business approving, the 2473 was replaced with GT7 number 4299. The railroad's first look of purchase. GP7 number 1500 was purchased soon after in 1996 to help with the increasing workload, and in 1997, Fourth and Western's classy blue and yellow paint scheme was adapted. The railroad now rosters around 33 locomotives made up of GP38 veterans, GP40-2s, GP40s, genset yard switchers, and SD40-2s. And the one thing I like about the railway is each locomotive has set a lot more on it than something written about Tarrant County or Fort Worth, so it's pretty cool to see one when they come running by. My third is the 2018 Tarantula unit. So there's a history on the 4th and Western right there, folks. Shorter than the one about the cotton mill. Now, when Mr. Davis started the railway, he wanted to start an excursion train. So, he was looking for a steam locomotive to get. And he gave the railway name the Tarantula. Now, how did he get the name? Well, here's a map of the railways of Fort Worth, and I think the name speaks for itself. As you can see, it looks like a Tarantula spider. 
pretty funny, I think. All them legs. <laughs> what? All them legs. Oh, all them legs, indeed. But the railway didn't make its way to Grapevine until many years later. In fact, when the railway started, they only ran from 8th Avenue to the stockyards every day. It was a short run. But the vision the railway made its way to Grapevine, and in 2005 was acquired by the city and changed to what is now the Grapevine Village River. Now here's a history lesson about the steam engine the railway currently owns. Steam locomotive, number 2248, is a 460 10-wheeler, oil-fired steam engine. She was built in 1896 for the Sun Pacific by the Coke Locomotive and Machine Works of Patterson, New Jersey. She is the oldest steam locomotive operating in regular service in the southern United States. Coach cars and observation cars were built originally as electric MU interurbans for the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. I forgot to mention the passenger car history is included in here as well. You'll see photographs later about that. The open air cars were once standard coaches that came from the Wallbest Railroad, and one was used in the film Hello Dolly. They then went to the Strasburg Road, and then all the cars were bought along with Puffy by Mr. Davis, the custom rebuilt and put worth by the 4th and Western. 2248 is a leaving, living, breathing, fire-eating, steam, snorting dragon that came to Fort Worth from another long-ago time in favor of far distant place. She worked in the assorted lands of California for 60 years before being retired in 1959. In the first 30 years, she pulled passenger and freight service trains from the end of the Gulf State to the other, including the Pacific Fruit Express. She once had the honor and privilege of pulling a train that carried the 27th President of the United States, President William Howard Taft, when he came to visit California. 20 years in the 1930s and 1940s, she was a regular firefighter. A sign with the firefighting cars, a few firefighting cars, which by the way are still in use to this day. Her job was to fight fires in the Sierra Nevada mountains, protect forests and wood in uh, woodlands and tunnels and snowsheds along the Southern Pacific tracks. In the 1950s, she was gusted up with a fake diamond stack, and she traveled the West Coast in a special exhibit train for festivals and celebrations. In 1959, she was retired for health reasons. Her flues were rusted out in the city, and she was taken to the city of Angels, Los Angeles, in Southern California, by Charles T. Brown who was a highway construction contractor and built some of the first freeways in California. Brown knew Walt Disney and were friends, and together they planned to see the to use 2048 and design a railroad museum that was to be built in the Los Angeles Griffith Park. The plans did not work out. The railroad park never opened, but later Disneyland did, but without 2248. Is it true you guys do? Uh, sorry. In 1974, she came to East Texas, where she worked for two years on the Texas State Railroad. Which runs between Rusk and Palestine, and was renumbered 200. In fact, she helped start up the Texas State Railroad. In 1990, she moved to Fort Worth and to the 4th and Western Railroad and was given back her original number, 2248. In 1991, a year later, restored, refurbished, and ready to roll for a million dollars, by the way. 2248 was placed back in service, proudly pulling passenger train. And in 2000, 
24 days and all her passenger cars were moved to the city of Grapevine, Texas, where she resides today. Now, some of that was actually just a little off. That script was taken from a videotape I have, which you'll see in a minute. She actually was a firefighter back in the 1890s before she became a t before she became a passenger agent on the railway today. Now, I've got some photographs of Buffy. I'll show you guys right quick. Actually, first, bring the camera and I'll show you what I have. What's able to do with Buffy on the transit the railway itself? All right. So, what do we have here? Well, we got some photographs up here of Puffy. I'll cut the camera. Stop. Okay. All right. So, tell us what what do we have here? Well, we have some photographs and some other stuff from Puffy. So, at the top here, we have two various pictures I like. This is her in the snow scene, and believe it or not, but about ten people took the same photograph in one day. Wow. I mean, why not? A train in the snow scene is amazing. <laughs> Right over here, we have a picture of her going by the Trinity River, by the city of Grapevine. It's one of my favorite pictures right there of all time. And if you look right over here, we have a picture of some people standing in front of her. Um, so to say, I do not know their names, but I know a lot of them worked with the Fourth and Western. We then have various timetables and brochures, and each one is different. These are all the years that they went through for the railway. We have a postcard that talks about Puffy. So there she is on the front, a fantastic photograph. It's out of date and old, but still, those are some of the facts about the railway right there, as you can learn and see. If you ride the train today, this is what they give out um, about her. Uh, this talks about the equipment on the railway itself. This is a videotape called Trangelo Express, and this was made back in the 90s, and they used to sell it. It's a 30-minute documentary about Puffy. And by the way, it's on my YouTube channel. If you guys want to go and watch it, you can. And it features the only song written about the railway called The Ballad of the Trangelo Express. Ooh. Now this right here came from a train exhibit that was set up in the city of Grapevine at one point. They don't do it anymore, but still it's pretty cool. I actually filmed that. It's also on my channel if you guys want to go and watch it. Also, it turns out the railway had its own newspaper, and this is it. They called it the Steamer Times. This is only when she was running, though, from the Fort Worth Stockyards to 8th Avenue and back. So still, it's pretty cool. We didn't have two magazines from Ralph and Routing. They talk about Puffy and the Tarantula, as you can see. Surprisingly, Trains Magazine has not done anything about the railway just yet that I know of. We then have a LCCA, Wire Collection Club of America, Fourth and Western Boxcar. Now, in real life, the Fourth and Western does not own any Rolling Stones, there's local mills, but still, this is pretty cool. It's very hard to find, too, but worth it. We then have the only book made about the railway called Tarantula Project, the story of the Fourth and Western Railroad. Mr. Davis and some people put this together. It took about half a year to find the copy, but I finally got one. And I've read a ton of train stories over the years, but this one has got to be the best by far, and I love it. And if you're watching this, Mr. Davis, thank you so much for bringing Steve back to Fort Worth. We appreciate it very much. Last but not least, we have this hat right here. And they used to have a train store in the stockyards, but it's gone now. Miner's Gold now sits there. I'm not sure if you guys can read that, but maybe you can. doing a video right now. Thank you, yeah. Did you cut the camera? I'll explain why we cut the camera first. Yes. Um, so, sorry for that uh, brief interruption. Um, we had some visitors. Uh, pop over and uh, want to take a look at Sam's little display. I mean, it is a very impressive display, honestly. People love uh, trains, kids love, kids love trains, I don't mind a bit showing my stuff off. That's just fine. Yes, yes. And, um, I forgot to mention there's another program that was made about the rally called A Texas Teen Treasure. That is also on my channel. Go and check it out if you have not. It really is a nice program. Uh, I've seen it for myself. 
Awesome. So now I will show you the pictures of Puffy, and I'm only going to show a few pictures of the passenger cars. Oh yeah, the railway also owns a caboose, which is behind me. You'll see that in the photograph in a minute. And they also own, and they should be showing up in the photograph if you post them on the screen. Okay. A radio switch tower from Sherman, Texas, old Tower 16. I don't know the history about that, but if you go online, you can find it, and I don't really have time to talk about that. They also too own two former New Haven F-09s. One is used as the power for the train, the other one is the jury for the past because of the HEP generator, and it's very, very loud. And there's a truck holding up here. Oh, that's okay. Uh, I'm going to keep cutting. Where is he going? Oh, he's back now. Okay. So, before we actually talk about public history, how does the steam locomotive work? Well, engine fan 0 to 0 will explain the basics and mechanics of a steam engine. Go ahead. Yes. Um, so, basically, how a steam engine works is you have the, um, the firebox. And what that is, is this chamber that has the, um, that holds the, the fuel like the coal or wood of which the fireman would shovel into. And um, the firebox is connected to the boiler th via boiler, boiler tubes. Uh, now the boiler tubes, it actually has the heat from the fire traveling through it. So that when, um, when it heats up the water inside of the boiler, um, it turns that into steam. The steam rises into the dome where it is controlled by valves um, that is, well, connected to the throttle, which connects, well, I mean, which basically controls the speed of the locomotive. Uh, after that, the, um, the steam then um, travels down into the, the pistons, well, from the smoke box to the pistons. Got the camera again. <laughs> we attracted more visitors again. Yes, um, yeah, going. people just love his display. So. <laughs> Keep going. Alright, so basically where we left off was um, that, yes, the steam travels from the boiler into the, um, the cylinders of the steam engine, where they power the pistons, and the pistons are connected to rods, and those are the side rods of the engine. Those rods are connected to the drive wheels, and what 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 it, what happens is that the I mean, without going into like too much detail, the uh, steam the pushes steam the pushes the piston back and forth. Back and forth. Train go. Right. Steam locomotives are basically tea kettles on wheels. They. So to be careful to run them right, things could go wrong. And believe me, they have a history. So, that's basically how a steam engine works, and some are big, some are small, but they're pretty simple machines to operate, and it's literally a living, living, breathing beast. They are pretty darn cool. Now I'll show you guys the pictures of Puffy, very quick. But yeah, the railway also has another engine you'll see in a few minutes. Well, another diesel, and another steam engine. I'm going to take away Bluetooth steam. So here she is fighting fires in 1896. This is her first area, as you can see. Pretty cool. The fire train's not around very much anymore, but it's pretty cool to see, I think. Now this is her in the Southern Pacific paint scheme, as you can see. And there has been, there have actually been a few models made of this particular paint scheme in H or Nosco, but it's all brass. And as any model railroad will tell you, brass trains are expensive. Brass trains are expensive. <laughs> yeah. uh, he knows that's model railroading. Yeah. We found a Nosco variant for about three thousand dollars on eBay. So if any classic model train manufacturers are watching out there, make the Southern Pacific ten wheeler class. Oh, I forgot to mention, her class is a T1 type. He was a T1 10 wheeler. So here she is again in another paint scheme. And these photographs are labeled, but I'm not going to read them all. I'll just show you guys on each one. This is still puffy. This is when she had the diamond stack, as you can see. Alright, diamond stack. And, oh yeah, she 
She went to work for the Northwest Pacific Excursion Trade Company and was given the number 5453, as you can see here. 5453, yep. All right, sorry about that. We're filming on a different camera now. This is my phone camera instead of my video camera. It died. Yes, it died. Um, so Sam, if you, if you would uh, kindly so, pick up where you left off. So here she is using the diamond stack um, in her pasture, so as you can see. Okay. Let's zoom in. There's quite a few of different paint schemes. And here she is on the northwestern Pacific again, as you can see. Lovely picture. Now, this picture was taken of her in California. I forgot to mention there was an earthquake and, well, poor puppy fell on her side. But thankfully, the only damage that was done to her was a small dent on her cylinder. Oh. And if you look on her today, you can still see it, but it's not as bad. Okay. Steam engines are tough and strong. Yes, they are. Except when they blow up. Yeah. <laughs> now this picture, we're getting into the Texas State Road, which is number 200, as you can see. All right. There she is again, that's the TSR's 200. Now, folks, I gotta be honest, I'm kind of colorblind, but you can probably tell better than I can the differences in the colors in the photographs. So each one is unique. We're now getting into the 1990s in the fourth and western Tarantula's variant, as you can see. I forgot to mention too, she um, currently has, I think it's a Santa Fe RSP6 chime whistle. At one time she had a stove top, stove top, step top 5 chime whistle. I'm not sure what she had on the SP though, if that's what I know about her tarantula variants. Here she is again on the tarantula railway. Right. Stockyards. Deer antlers. I mean, like I said, these might look the same, but if you look closely, the details and the paint schemes are a bit different on each one. Surprisingly, no model trade manufacturer has made a model of Puffy in her fourth Western Transport paint scheme. However, except this trains? one. <laughs> what? Except this one soon. Lionel Trains, though, did come out to Grapevine at one point and take pictures of the equipment to make the Lone Ranger train set. Lord knows why they did that. They could have done a puppy train set. Yeah. Faster cars. There she is again, as you can see on the fourth and western. I mean, like I said, each one is just so different. This is the last one on the fourth and western. You can see her tender this time. And this is her current grapevine painting. Now, at the time this program is being made, Puffy is not on the rails. She is currently undergoing a major overhaul of what's called a 1472. Basically, every three to five years, if the steam locomotive operates a regular service, the whole thing has to be taken apart and inspected. It's a giant jigsaw puzzle and quite a process. So hopefully, by September or December of 2021, she'll be up and running soon enough. Now the other steam engine the railway owns is a little narrow gauge left love. It's a 242, and her name is Rachel. She currently sits in the engine set beside Puffy. I don't know her history or where she came from, I hate to say it, folks. But if you look online, maybe you can find out something about her. Or somebody in the comments can let you know about it. Now, the railway also owns a GP7, a former Santa Fe GP7, engine 2199, which was built by EMD for the Santa Fe originally, went to work for the Kansas Central, and now works on the Great Thumb Venture. Vinny, as the name implies to the diesel, oh, I forgot to mention, 
how did Puffy get the name and how did Vinny get the name? They held a naming contest for the public, and Puffy and Vinny won pretty much. Makes sense. Vinny is powered by an EMD 567 non turbo prime mover, has an Nathan K3LA horn, and an EMD brass belt. How does a diesel locomotive. <coughs> Pardon me. How does a diesel locomotive operate? Very simple. The engine turns a generator, which provides power to the traction motors, thus turning the wheels. The burn the diesel fuel to provide the combustion. The so steam by, engine is so by, uh, by the diesel. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. So by a common uh, misconception, the diesel engine doesn't power the wheels, it powers traction motors, right? That's right. So technically, it's a diesel electric, if you will. All right. Unfortunately, the diesel killed off the steam engine. But still, diesels are pretty cool because they brought color to the rails and something unique and different. But hey, I still love steam. Don't get me wrong. Who doesn't? <laughs> steam is classy. Well, here she is, and only a few pictures of her in her Santa Fe paint scheme. It's the blue and yellow uh, freak paint scheme, as you can see. Here she is in her Kansas Central paint scheme. Not the best, really. It's kind of dirty, but hey, that's how it went. And here she is in a very early variant of her Grade 5 Finish Road paint scheme. Now the paint scheme today looks a bit different. It's changed, but still, it's pretty cool. Now I'll show you guys the passenger cars right quick, but I'm not going to show each one because they all look the same. So here is one of the coach cars, as you can see. Very beautiful paint scheme. In fact, you can see it like right next to us. Oh, why it's don't like, you go ahead and flip it? <laughs> show it, show All it, right. show your camera. It's like right next to us, right? <laughs> okay, this is there's photograph, and if you flip it over there, that's one of the patio open air cars you can see. Open air coaches? I should have not stand the photographs. <laughs> that saves time! Right. Here is the caboose that sits behind me. This is an old Missouri Pacific Yard Transfer caboose. It's kind of short. They used to have it on the train, but before it was the ticket office at Eighth Avenue Yard, actually. Okay, I then. never had the chance to run it when, it when it was on the train. To be honest, folks, I'd rather run in a cupola caboose, not a bay window caboose. <laughs> Plus, it was 45 bucks to ride in that tiny thing. Oof. Not worth it. And here's the caboose right behind him, folks. Yeah, literally, I'm right in front of the thing. Now, the last story I'm going to tell you guys is about the a railway called Co-Rail. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, he knows the story already. There's a longer detailed person online. Just look up trans... Uh, uh, train collision train train, but I'm going to use the short, short version. Colorado was a railway company that was going to go across the country starting day train and had very bad success and got kicked out of two states. They came to Texas and they bought the floors of Western Railway and things started going downhill from the beginning. Anybody who stayed on took a pay cut or lost their jobs. Anybody who left was never allowed to come back. Colorado also took away benefits to the railway such as drinking water and first aid kits. The name of the train was actually the Texas Star Clipper Dinner Train. It was basically an Orient Express Mirror complete with a dumb car. But rail fans gave it the nickname, the Bondo Flyer. Now how did it get the name? Well, the passenger cars and the engines were so old, they had cracks in them. They used Bondo Putty to put on the cracks. So it got the name, the Bondo Flyer. Well, in 2000, the railway finally went under for good. Train made its way to the stockyards, no more run, with the Co-Rail F units. They had two F units, I believe, F3s, from the Illinois Center. And, well, the guy driving is not certified to be an engineer. And he puts the F unit on backwards. And as you know in running, you do not put a wide-body locomotive like that on the train backwards. You can't see down the side. Wide-body, I should say car-body. It's a car-body type of That's what they call it. We don't put one on backwards. It's dangerous. 
We are leaving the stockyards. We're going about five miles now. Pull on, I think, to the Y for a yard called Peach Yeah. There's the fourth, the Western Frederick on that same track going three miles an hour. They collide. Thankfully, nobody was injured, but the former superintendent, Iona Robbins, who was in the lead car behind the locomotive, had to duck twice to avoid getting hit by a big 1920s cash register. There were kids on the train, too. Some of them were hurt, sadly to say. The railway had a good safety record, the tarantula did, until that very night when it happened. They didn't get back to Grape until about 2 o'clock in the morning when my wreck was finally cleared and cleaned up. After that, Cobra was banned and kicked out of Grape Finance for work altogether, and about a year later, they finally went out of business. And now I have two photographs from Cobra, I will show you guys. And here's the F, as you can see. Classy looking. I think it looks more like the area like I want it, but one of my friends says it's going on Central. I don't know anything about that railway. <laughs> and lastly, here's the wreck. And my papers are blowing away. They had firefighters around the scene because they thought it would have caught fire because the fuel tank burst. Thankfully, that did not happen. Are there any more photos, photos of that incident? That is the only one I could find online. I looked, so this is like the only photograph of the co-rail incident you're gonna find. Wow. So the lesson here is, don't let a big corporation take over a short line railroad. They'll run it. <laughs> <laughs> and for the Thomas fans watching, the alle allegory to Mattel. <laughs> yes. And the stupid season 25. And darn you, Chugging Ten, you're awful! <laughs> yes. Alright, what other questions do you have for me? I think I covered most of them. Yes, I think you did. Um, let's Anything see, what else? you think you missed, go ahead and ask me. I'm trying to think if I've missed anything, I don't think I have. Okay, so, let's see, how about this one? Why is this place important to the city of Grapevine? We need to preserve the history of this country before the liberals try to take it away and erase it for good, because if you erase it, it's like it never happened. And the reason this is important is because, well, the railway started the city of Grapevine. Trains helped build this country and make us who we are today. They helped us fight wars. Everywhere a train stopped, a town would seem to spring up overnight. This railway isn't maintained and well taken care of, it won't be around much longer, so it needs plenty of TLC plenty of care to operate. It's very important to the state of Grapevine because of the history it gives to generations of rail fans to come and enjoy. Yes. Alright. Um, let's see, what else do I have? Yes. Um, do you have any information on when and how the two newer diesel locomotives arrived at the railroad? I already went over it, but I will gladly do it one more time. Okay, sorry. I don't know much about the FL9s. Um, other than the fact they came from the New Haven Railroad, they have a different wheel arrangement. In fact, to my knowledge, the only American locomotive to have this arrangement, they have four wheels in the front and six in the back. Basically, it's a ten wheeler, if you will. Um, they are equipped with AGP or head and power, and are powered by either five, six, or seven prime movers. 2014. Has a Leslie S5T horn. 2016 has a Nathan K5LA first generation air track. I could be wrong. I may have them backwards. If anybody's watching, feel free to correct me in the comments. Um, they were repainted into a paint scheme that kind of matches the passenger cars. One is used to power the train. The other one is used to power the passenger cars with its uh, pri excuse me generator. Um, and that's, like, literally all I know about them. Oh, okay. That's fine. It's pretty cool to see an F unit on a train again. They're classy and stylish. Yes. Let's hope they don't run them backwards again and they learn their lesson. Uh-oh. <laughs> have to watch out for that. Yes. Um, let's see. If you could describe the Grapevine Vintage Railroad in five words, what would they be? Vintage. Sleek. Colorful. Historic, 
slash nostalgic, excuse me, historic slash nostalgic, mm -hmm. and one heck of a fine train ride every time. All right. Close enough, I think. Right, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, let's see, what else do I have? Oh, I may have mentioned this before too, folks, but for doing this, he's going to make me a model of Puff the you know scale. Yes, I, I will try and get that done <laughs> to the best of my ability. And if you don't, I'll tie you to the train tracks. Uh oh. I'm kidding. Right. <laughs> I'm not that crazy. All right. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think you covered everything here. Well, okay. oh, well. except um, how about this one? Uh, what would you recommend to those who have never been here before? If you come to Grapevine, there's all kinds of places to shop around and eat. Uh, there's wineries, there's a couple of museums, there's an art museum, um, and the Ice House is where the historic district is. There's a lot of historic buildings down there. Of course, you have the Grapevine Fidger Road. There's a new hotel they opened up recently. It's got live music, and it's pretty cool. Um, that's what I recommend to do to come, if you come to Grapevine. It's, it's quite a nice little town. And there aren't many towns left like this in America that are small, so... Come and see it for yourself. All it's right. a great town. Awesome. Alright, with that being said, uh, do you have any final thoughts to add for everyone watching this documentary? Oop. Don't worry about the stuff lying around. We're almost done anyway, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a few final thoughts. This train means a lot to me, and I really hope that whenever the Lord calls me home to that great railway in the sky, It'll still be here for many people to come and enjoy and love it as much as I do. Kids love it, adults love it, I love it, and it, it has a special place in my heart, like a lot of people I've got to know for years. And if it's not too careful, well maintained, it won't be here. So I hope anybody who wants to get a job here loves this train as much as I do. And also, folks, Use your common sense around trains and please be safe. Don't walk on train tracks. Do not climb on equipment. Look, stop looking, listen at the crossing before you cross the tracks. Don't try to beat the trains to the crossing. It's not worth it. If your car gets stuck on the tracks, just leave it. It can be replaced. You can't. Don't climb on train equipment. Don't go trespassing in train yards. Follow the conductor's instructions. And if you really want to know more about trains, Look online at videos, read books, or talk to people who work for the railroad. That's where they try to climb on the equipment itself, believe me. Be safe around trains. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Well, Texas... Well, hold on now. <laughs> one more show. Uh, a little more. Show. The bonus. Bonus section. You could say that. So as was mentioned, the Trangela had its own newspaper. Well, so did the Great Mind for the Railroad. And here it is. Okay. Awesome. Isn't that something, folks? Pretty cool, isn't it? Yes. I'll show you the back of it, too, when you're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> so, our map of the cotton belt. They don't give these out anymore either, Sally the Sith. We need to bring some of this good stuff back they used to do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, there you have it, folks. All right. If this is being watched on Engine Fan 020's channel, please subscribe to him. If you're watching this on my channel, please subscribe, subscribe to, to me. Yeah. Hit the notification bell so you see when we upload new videos on our channels. And God bless all of you out there watching. Yes. Yeah, I wish you blessings, joy, and happiness, and all the great stuff in the world. Yeah. So uh, thank you ever so much, Mr. Texas Train Master 2248, a.k.a. Sam, <laughs> for your time coming out today. Oh, my um, pleasure. More than happy to. Yes, um, I, I don't n normally have guests on my channel, but you're the first one. <laughs> oh, well, um, there you have it. Yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, expect more videos from me in the near future. Uh, so this is EngineFan020 with... Hold on. Yeah, re record that ending because <laughs> that one stopped. Go. Ready? Yeah. So until next time, folks, please like, share, subscribe, and comment on our channels. Hit the notification bell you see when we upload a new video. May all your skills be green. I wish you blessings and happiness. And I'll see you.